So my friends, here it is, done a little differently. This is chapter 13, The Lens, and it's the fourth part of that chapter. You remember Danny and Carol were going to see Paul O'Hanlon, or Paul Hanlon, who might be able to help them with the investigation. That's where we take the story up. As Danny and Carol entered the gateway of Paul Hanlon's home, a very agile sheepdog came running toward them and barked in a friendly manner so that within seconds he was responding to Carol's friendly voice and stroking hand. The welcoming animal followed them to the front door and as they waited for an answer to Danny's knock, Carol stroked the dog behind one ear. The garden was interesting to the greens being like their own, having bird feeders and bird tables as well as a medium sized pond. It was not a pristine garden with rows of flowers. It was Carol's kind of garden where managed wildness and naturalness was the overall impression. There's beehives at the back, whispered Carol as they waited. Four of them. Although they were only a short distance from the village of Catladdy, they could have been far into the wilds around them. It was a truly peaceful spot. When the door opened, the dog was sitting on Carol's foot. A middle-aged, white-haired and white-bearded man filled the door with warm, hazy blue eyes. And how are you doing? You must be Danny and Carol. Tell a little lady alone now. Come in, I've been expecting you. As they entered the room, the heat of the range greeted them as did the steaming kettle that sat shinily on top of it. Hello, Paul. Good to meet you. Danny held out his hand and it was heartily shaken. Carol held hers out and gave their host the I like you already smile. Sit down. I'll put Denver out. No, Paul, please don't. I like him. Carol's attitude to Paul's best friend endured her to him. Well behave then, Denver. Now are you for tay? Very quickly, they were all three sitting in the large open plan room and Denver sat between the greens with his head on Carol's lap. There was no rush from Paul Allen to get down to the business of the day. He discussed the weather, the history of the dog, told them he and Denver lived alone, his wife having left him some years before. They commented on his garden and Carol asked a few intelligent questions about the bees and flowers. Truth is, Danny and Carol, I'm here to help in any way I can, if I can, I, and to make sure you don't get yourself shot. How much do you know, Paul? Danny was a bit concerned. I know that you were captured up in the hills, and that a certain mutual acquaintance thought you were investigating one thing, but he was relieved to find out you were really wildlife investigators. I also know you're a writer, Danny, and, and since my chat with our friend, it dawned on me that I read an article by you about night jars, right? You have a good way with words, if I may say so. Thanks, Paul. It's kind of important that not too many know about this investigation, though. Danny Green's face was full of anxiety. Paul Hanlon smiled broadly. Relax, Danny. I know plenty about what goes on around here, and believe me, I learned a lot of years ago that it's wise to learn much, but share a little. I mean, knowledge about other people's business. I don't pry, but if you keep your eyes and your ears open and your mind tuned in, you get to know what the score is. Score is. That doesn't mean you have to be a transmitter as well. Also, a mutual friend who interrogated you up in the hills. Well, his father was closer to me than a brother, so whenever the wild Republican son who thinks he has to risk his neck to make me free asks a favour, well, it's as good as done. Anyways, anyone coming up here to help protect the wildlife, well, they're a friend of ours for sure, isn't that right, Denver? The dog's ears rose and his eyes opened at the mention of his name. We don't like, he continued, presumably speaking for himself and his canine companion, people exploiting the birds and the animals, and all the more so if it's endangered species we're talking about. Any more damage being done to them makes me as sick as a dry toad, so if we can help you, we will help you. Carol responded with a heartfelt, thanks. Anyway, sounds like you, dear Protestant child and English hubby, need a bit of a hand up here in the Wild West. His shining eyes and smile removed any thought that there were, might be bitterness there. This was Irish humour, not division. Paul Hanwin was never a bitter man. He had a passion for the wild things and the wild places. He liked the natural balance and it didn't bother him if a fox killed a rabbit. But he didn't like to see the fox get in the farmer's hens. So if the farmer shot the fox for that, that was okay. But just hunting and shooting things for the sport made him angry. And the only time he'd ever had to face a court of law was after he fought with three men in a country bar who were bragging about digging badgers out and killing them. 
Not so much of the poor Protestant child, if you don't mind, Carol replied in the same friendly manner as the comment had been spoken in. Then she added, I know, Paul, we were a bit foolish poking around up there. I should have known better. It was just that we had some good information. She looked at Danny and he nodded. What do you know about a man called Michael O'Connor? Oh, him. He's a strange one. Nobody seems to know much about him. Well, we do, Danny added, and I don't think, Paul, that you will be too happy with Mr. O'Connor when we tell you what we know. So he's mixed up in all this, is he? Oh, aye. Carol lifted a poor belonging to Dylan as she spoke. That's where we were when the boys got wind of us. Any area of the border where there are strangers, they're just open to suspicion. You were mad, you know, but I admire your courage. The more he talked to the Greens, the more he was being drawn to them and to their cause. Danny hadn't brought along any written records, thinking it would be unwise, but he quoted from memory. O'Connor claims to be able to supply raptors on demand, eggs, chicks, adult, male or female, or dead and stuffed. Well, I'd like to dead and stuff him. Paul's heart had been reached okay. Dylan stirred as he heard the harshly spoken words of his master. So Danny appealed. What we want to find out is, who does he deal with over here? And how does he ship the illegal deliveries to his customers? We want to know how large his operation is and see how it fits with what we already know is going on across the water. Interesting questions. Who are these scum that would take young peregrines or eggs from the nest to fill their own filthy pockets? How big is this in Britain? The question was aimed at both of them and he looked from face to face. Well, Paul, we're not sure yet. It seems a bit like the iceberg that is always bigger than it looks. It's not just Britain and Ireland. Our investigations have revealed information about people like O'Connor from all over the world. As big as that? Yes, Paul. Danny drained his cup of tea. These people behave as if there were no borders, no laws, no rights for wildlife, just profit. It's all they're interested in. Aye, and security here is pretty tight the way things are. Of course, the so-called security forces are looking for guns and the like, really. It would be hard to find anything out. We can't really go back. Danny searched the man's face. Maybe we're asking too much of you, Paul. Maybe you wouldn't be able to find anything out. Well, Danny, it's a challenge. I'll grant you that, but sure, what's life without a challenge? You know, Danny and Carrie, you've impressed me from from the things I've heard about you already. Some of the best speeches in Irish history were made when someone had their backs to the wall. Aye, many of them just before they were executed. I guess what it really is, is that when a man or a woman, Paul looked at Carol and laughed, when anyone's eyeballing death, the things that are really important to him rise to the surface. Sometimes folk make more sense of their lives then than they do at any other time, just before the final full stop, I mean. Better sense than all the other chapters love their life put together. Danny Green, the writer, liked the metaphorical language. Paul continued, There was a good-for-nothing lad in his early twenties down in the village a few years back. Him and his cronies had upset the IRA, and they wanted some information, so they took the young fellow down to the fields by the river. They gave him a spade and told him to start digging his own grave. Aye, they asked him with a gun pointed at him what his final words were, and he said, Thank me, Mammy, for putting up with me. Tell her I love her. Before that, I doubt if he'd ever thanked her for a thing nor said anything encouraging and nice to her. Carol asked the inevitable. Did they shoot him? Not at all, Carol. They wouldn't have wasted a bullet. They got the information they wanted okay and let him go with a threatening warning. He went home to start plaguing his mother's life all over again. But the point I'm making is that under that kind of pressure, what's really inside gets squeezed out. Know what I mean? Paul was pouring the more strong tea. Up there in the mountain, you two impressed some very hard men with your courageous nagging about the damage done by the illegal wildlife trade. I'm not sure how much the subject got through to them, but one thing's sure, your courage did. You're brave people, Danny and Carol, and I'll be glad to do a little work on your behalf. I need a couple of hours to think about my strategy. It's better to think it through a bit first. Thanks, Paul. Carol's expression was from deep inside and it was not ingratitude for the second cup of tea. Paul nodded his head. So folks, how did Denver and I get hold of you? 
We go back to Carol's folks tonight, so I'll give you the phone number. Danny wrote out the name of Carol's family and the farmhouse address and telephone details. That's fine. Now can I show you to animal lovers my beehives and then fix you something up to eat before I take this critter for his daily long walk? As he looked at the address he asked Carol about someone he knew up in that area and Carol didn't know the person but they worked out that her brother had been at school with the son of the house. Danny was ever amazed at the way everyone in Northern Ireland seemed to know someone in common regardless of distance, age or religion. After a very pleasant lesson in beekeeping, followed by the best of conversation and excellent food, the Greens were driving back through Claddy out to Sion Mills and taking the journey back to Carol's home. Both of them expressed the same confidence in Paul Hanlon and Carol felt they'd found another true friend. These feelings were not misplaced. When they were getting in the car, Paul had said that he had hoped to see them soon. He gave them a comb of honey and as they drove into the village, Paul was already sitting in his garden planning things out. He had to get into the house, so the first thing was to find out how long O'Connor was away for. Then he, had to, then he knew where to find the alcoholic nephew. It would pain him to take advantage of a man with a drink problem, but in this case the end would justify the means. A couple of hours in the house should be enough, he felt. Any business leaves traces behind, a trail to be followed up, and O'Connor's yard did not suggest that he was a meticulous, careful man. Paul poked a stick into his pond, making gentle ripples glow over the surface. A black bird was singing enthusiastically from a nearby horse chestnut tree, and the sunshine was filtering through its branches. Paul had a very strong loyalty to his community, and he usually resist resisted any interference from outsiders, but this was different. The interferers here were not the Greens, but rather the collectors and suppliers. What the Greens were doing was like the gentle, unobtrusive ripples he was producing on the pond. O'Connor's game was different. He was like someone draining the pond, and he really deserved whatever was coming to him. When he'd been at school, he had only twice gone to the te once gone to the teacher to tell tales on his mates, and that was when they were robbing nests, nest after nest, in fact, of eggs. This was similar, and if anything he found was eventually used in court against anyone, well, he had no problem with that. The lads at school had beaten him up very badly over the bird's eggs incident, but this time he wasn't worrying. Hopefully nobody would ever know that he'd been involved, but if he did have any problems, he had friends in the IRA, and they had an interest in this case, even if it was only a passing one. So, Paul Hanlon is working out how he can get into the house and find out what O'Connor's up to. That is something that Danny and Carol wouldn't find possible. We have to do that, don't we, sometimes? Get help from other people. And Danny and Carol are ready to do that if it's people they trust. Thanks for listening, my friends. This episode's a bit late. It's been kind of busy here lately. But I look forward to sharing the next one with you, the start of a new chapter, very soon. Bye-bye for now. Hope this new way of doing this has worked out okay. Bye-bye now. Bye.